I also like have these super fancy headphones. <laughs> you think I figured out how to use them in time? <laughs> that your like, audio is fine. It's perfect. Well, thank you. That's great. I would rather have like yeah. really good podcast level quality, but my yeah. husband actually got these and um, told me they would be great and solve my problems. And they yeah. probably I would sit and read the manual, right? But we, we, are, we are not Joe Rogan level at the moment. So it's it's fine. Okay. <laughs> okay okay is that your real background it's gorgeous is that where you are it's so nice yeah, yeah because it's late there right yeah it's um 8 p.m now here in hamburg yeah yeah you picked that time i mean that's okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i'm really really happy that that you made it um i'm i'm personally i'm really happy because i'm i'm a big fan of your work from the beginning to be honest oh that's so nice we're really happy to have you. I'm, I'm really, really happy to be honest. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I think it's fun to talk about medical training because it's something that you don't, you know, like these headphones, they came with a book. I just won't read it. But your medical training doesn't come with any book. I mean, this is a very hokey thing to say. Um, everyone, I think, just figures it out along the way and takes advice from various people. So I love getting advice. Um, and, you know, in circumstances where I can give useful advice, I don't know. Um, you know, that's that's great. Um, I saw your paper in Blood Advances, which is very cool. Congratulations. Thank you very um, much. We've thought of stem cell boost for our patients with bad cytopenias, but have never really had to go through with it. But obviously, there's a subset of patients where it makes sense. And so, you know, it was great. It's great to have that data set out there. So congratulations. Very nice work. Thank you very much. I think it, particularly for myeloma, it's quite attractive because most of them have stem cells and their and the refrigerator and uh, what we now usually do we just give them prophylactically because we see that it works quite well and does no harm that's interesting and, um yeah. well for myeloma we didn't use it so far but i think we we will we just go with it and see what happens sure no it's a really interesting thought i like that uh, um let's start with your background um, sure. Maybe you introduce yourself, who you are, and uh, what you do, what you currently do, and maybe a bit of your history. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Jennifer Bredno. I am an associate research physician, which is the U.S. government NIH way of sort of saying that your position is close to an associate professor who's kind of on a clinical investigator track. Um, and yeah, I work at the National Institutes of Health here in Bethesda, Maryland in the U.S., which is a suburb of Washington, D.C., um, through the National Cancer Institute, which is one of the institutes of the National Institutes of Health. Um, and my mentor and supervisor is Dr. James Kokendurfer, who's very senior in the field of CAR T cell therapy and really pioneered a lot of the field. And so I do clinical trials research with him. Right now, my position is actually exclusively phase one clinical trials of CAR T cell therapy, new CAR T cell constructs and products here at the NIH Clinical Center. Um, and the NIH Clinical Center is, um, I think you've had folks from here on your podcast before, but it's a little bit unique in that we have a research hospital and really with a few exceptions, but almost exclusively, we're taking care of patients who are participating in clinical research trials, not just in oncology, but in other specialties, hematology, rheumatology. Um, so it's a really unique place and it's an exciting place to work. Um, and so how did I get here? Um, not, not by plan. Um, the US system, I, I think this may have some contrast with the system in Europe, but it's very, very long um, to include, you know, undergraduate school and then medical school is actually a graduate program that you decide on after undergraduate school. And then you do residency, which it sounds like that's about the level that you are um, and subspecial training, subspecialty training in oncology after that. Um, and then sometimes there are even these, you know, BMT or cell therapy fellowships you can do for a year after that. So it's potentially a very long road. Um, and I think that if you're someone who's interested in a lot of things or potentially um, indecisive, like I was in some ways, um, that actually has a few positives in that you can kind of decide what's your next step um, every step of the way. So I grew up in the state of Georgia in sort of a smallish town called Augusta, which happened to be the place where the medical college, which Georgia was located, 
my parents were academic pediatricians um, and you had Helen Heslop on, right? And yeah. um, I think she talked a little bit about this too. And I think a lot of kids of physicians kind of have this ambivalence about medicine, right? Because you see positives and negatives. Um, so when I went to college, I actually really looked in, I sort of studied environmental science, ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, and so originally my thought was, well, maybe I'll get sort of a PhD in environmental science. Maybe I'll go to law school and go into environmental law. Um, and I ended up sort of looping back and thinking, well, I should reconsider medicine. And I, I shadowed actually an interventional cardiologist, um, which was not something that I was particularly interested in at the time. And I think as a college kid, I sort of thought, oh, this guy is going to do procedures all day. And I don't know if that's my thing, but he was so, he was, he was just so talented. And I think worked really hard in talking with the patients and the patient's families and really helped guide them through something that's really scary, right? Like if you have a myocardial event and then you need some kind of intervention or even just a cath, that's a really scary thing for the patient, for the family members. Um, and I was just really um, drawn to being able as part of my career to talk to patients and family members about something that is potentially frightening um, or even life-threatening and, you know, help them help get them through that with the tools that we have. Um, and as you can see, doing CAR T-cell therapy, I do a lot of that now. Um, and so that was really what drew me into medicine. And then I went um, back home to Georgia, to Emory in Atlanta and did medical school, which was a great experience. Um, and they were really encouraging of folks who wanted to take an extra year to do research between their third and final year of medical school to do that. So I came here actually to the National Institutes of Health. I did a year of bench research, lab research in Dr. Neil Young's lab, who is um, a senior aplastic anemia investigator and really one of the world experts in aplastic anemia. Um, and I loved it. I had a great time doing bench research. It was fascinating. Um, Roger Rodrigo Colado at the time was a, um, who's still doing research in this area in Brazil, um, at the time was a postdoc in the lab. And he really just guided me through everything and taught me all these lab techniques that I had no idea about before doing the, the year away. Um, and I decided I didn't really want to be the endpoint of a lab investigator, um, like Neil Young. Um, that I really, really wanted to be a clinician primarily, but it would be so great and, you know, a great maybe goal in the future to work with, um, you know, work very closely with someone who runs a lab, um, but really focus on clinical trials research. But I was just a med student. I didn't really know, you know, what was going to happen. I'll say as kind of a total detour that sort of just occurred to me that when I was a first year med student, there was a panel of doctors that kind of talked to all the students about what is in your future in medicine. And one of them, kind of a youngish guy said, well, I think that first of all, half of what we know is going to be wrong, which I think they say a lot in medical school. That's kind of a stereotypical thing to say um, and not wrong, but just developed upon more. And he said, I think a lot of you guys are going to specialize in things that don't exist now. And I just remember thinking this guy is a little bit out there. This is very unlikely. Um, but, you know, you've seen this too, right? A lot in our field in transplant and cell therapy just didn't exist. Um, at the time that this guy made the statement, CAR T cell therapy really didn't exist beyond, you know, a few phase one trials of, you know, car constructs that didn't have co-stim domains <laughs> um, and, you know, and things that were seen sort of preclinically in the lab. Um, so anyway, sort of an interesting detour. So I came out of med school sort of thinking, I really like internal medicine. I like taking care of adults. I like infectious disease. I like oncology, hematology. Um, certainly the exposure to hematology with, you know, in Dr. Neil Young's group at NIH had influenced me. Um, so I did internal medicine residency at Hopkins. Um, they're a very big center in terms of hematologic malignancy. So you cannot help but get lots of exposure to that. I thought it was really fascinating. I thought that stem cell transplant was really interesting. At the time, you know, Johns Hopkins in part pioneered haploidentical stem cell transplants. And that was a very you know, new thing when I was a very sort of clueless and lost intern. Um, Chris Kanakri now really works in post-transplants like lofosamide and how does it work and can we make it better? He was my, you know, fellow who had the unfortunate job of supervising me. Um, and so, you know, that, that whole area was just really interesting. Um, at the same time, 
um, whenever I did outpatient care in the oncology center, um, you know, shadowing or helping the attending physicians, um, it was clear that immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy was going to be really big. At the time, if ipilimumab was just barely approved for, you know, metastatic melanoma, and essentially there was nothing else, but there was a lot in clinical trials, and you could kind of tell that nivolumab and pembrolizumab were going to really change oncology. Um, so I came out of residency with the idea that there were these two really interesting things. There were hematologic malignancies and there were immune therapies and not really knowing much else and having a really kind of open mind. Um, so I came back to NIH for fellowship in hematology and oncology. Um, and it was clear here that cellular therapy was just really exciting and cutting edge. At the time when I started fellowship, there were no commercially approved CAR T cell agents um, and really it was all anti-C19 CAR T cells. Um, so that was something that I kind of had in the back of my mind that was really interesting. And I just, you know, tried to work with people that I thought were doing interesting things. Um, I was really lucky to work with Wyndham Wilson and Karen Dunleavy and Mark Krzyzewski, and they, they were all, you know, amazing mentors. I learned so much about taking care of all the different subtypes of lymphoma from them. Um, and then when I was rotating on the inpatient service for transplant and cell therapy, where they always need trainees to help out. Um, you know, I, I sort of saw, um, you know, Dr. James Copinger, Virgin Copinger for my mentor's patients. At the time, he was the, the protocol for doing CAR T cell donor lymphocyte infusions was really new. And it was just amazing to me that these patients who had ALL, CLL, large cell, you know, take your pick, all B cell malignancies that had every type of therapy, including allogeneic stem cell transplant and multiple standard DLIs that you could give a CAR T cell donor lymphocyte infusion and they would go into remission. And I saw this is so creative and amazing and was really this bench to bedside translational research. Like I think that you don't, you don't often really see and was really reminded me of what I had saw, I had seen in Neil Young's lab and what sort of attracted me to working at NIH in the first place. Um, so then I worked with him during fellowship and worked on the data analysis for that clinical trial that I mentioned. Um, just I guess towards the tail end of my research years at fellowship, he uh, had developed um, anti-BCMA CARs a and anti-BCMA CAR in the lab and had done the very first phase one clinical trial of anti-BCMA CARs. Um, and we were just starting to see responses in those patients. And you know, as you probably know, I was involved in writing up the data from those patients. Um, and that was also, you know, just really amazing to see that these myeloma patients had had everything and, you know, the first few patients that we saw response in had really high burden disease and was just, you know, depleted down to nothing um, after anti-BCMA CAR T cell therapy. Um, so after fellowship, um, I was really lucky. He hired me into the group and then I've sort of been there ever since doing phase one trials of CAR T cell therapy. Um, and it's been, you know, really quite a journey, but so much, as you can tell, so much of that is serendipity <laughs> and figuring things out as you go along. Um, and so, yeah, I just feel really lucky because it's been a really, you know, amazing experience here at the NCI to work with all these really creative people who are amazing clinicians and researchers, you know, all at the same time. Yeah, you you pointed out the, like, the speciality of NIH, and especially since COVID, I guess, um, NIH is just huge name uh, every everyone knows there is something called nih and yeah. um, you, you already highlighted some like really really positive things um what what would you say if you if, if you could summarize what the nih is what's so special about it what what would you say what what is it what right. makes it so special no, that's a really great point. So, and I think it means a lot of things. So I guess I'll say, first of all, so to NIH National Institutes of Health. So this is um, a part of the US government health and human services. Um, and so institutes, there are many institutes. And so I'm in the National Cancer Institute. Um, and then for instance, Neil Young that I mentioned is at the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute or NHLBI. And there's a quote unquote extramural program and an intramural program. So the extramural program is actually a funding mechanism for many university investigators across the US and is a really, really important funding mechanism. Um, and I'll say that that is actually most of the National Cancer Institute is this sort of extramural entity. Um, 
And uh, here on the NIH campus, um, we're kind of a small piece of the pie, which is the Center for Cancer Research. So we're the part of the NCI that is actually on campus in Bethesda, Maryland, that is using this clinical center, um, which is again is a hospital used almost exclusive, exclusively for clinical trial participants. Um, and so it's, I think, a really great use of U.S. taxpayer dollars. I'm really grateful for U.S. taxpayers um, that this is possible. Um, but essentially, the patients who come to us to participate in clinical trials, they are very often taking on a lot of risk and unknowns. That's especially true, of course, for phase one CAR T-cell studies. And so the U.S. government, through the clinical center of the NCI, essentially pays for all the medical care. Um, we collect uh, as you know, in the U.S., we have third-party insurance, so we collect insurance information in case, in the rare event that patients need an outside procedure that we can't provide here at the clinical center, then we would use the insurance so they could get that procedure at another hospital. But otherwise, we really don't use patient insurance. We essentially are able to fund all the medical care related to the clinical trial therapy, um, which I think is just a really fortunate scenario. And I think we're really able to learn a lot with clinical research because this facility exists. Um, and yeah, I just feel really lucky to be here. Yeah, for me, um, I asked that because for me, NIH from the beginning is just, um, I always smile if I if I see work from you because there's, all, I, I don't know, maybe I'm too romantic about science, but there's always this feeling of um, like novelty and, and inspiration and kind of freedom you don't often see in science because you have this old financial aspects, conflicts of interest, pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. And that was the same feeling I had when I first read um, your study uh, in JCO because there was this kind of, I, I cannot, cannot explain it, but it felt like there were people that had an idea and just went with it and made it happen. No, absolutely. And that I feel like in this building, there are so many brilliant people like Jim Kopendorfer who are just so creative and really can do it all. They can run a lab, they're excellent clinicians, and they can take this little idea and just, you know, really have the grit to really get it through the system. I mean, it's really amazing to think that. So he and Steve Rosenberg, you know, essentially developed the AxiCell construct. Mm -hmm. Um, in the lab and tested it, you know, in multiple phase one situations. I mentioned testing it as, you know, a, a CAR T cell donor lymphocyte infusion for patients with relapse after allo transplant. But then, of course, they tested it in the autologous situation with patients with various non Hodgkin lymphomas. Um, and, you know, eventually it became this commercially available product, you know, the second US FDA approved commercially available product. Um, and it's just really a cool story. I think you don't often. You don't often really see that a story like that sort of happen from the beginning and then kind of see the end result and have and know that so many patients are benefiting. So, yeah, and there's so many people like that in this building that are, um, you know, so humble and lovely um, that you don't even know you're running into in the hallway. And yeah, I just feel really lucky to be brushing shoulders with any of them, honestly. And if you look um, back to your um let's say first or second trial, let's maybe stick to the myeloma trial. Um, when you look back at it, what, what would you say, what were the biggest challenges you faced and maybe even the big, biggest successes, surprises even? Right, so I think about that trial now, so we're in a very different scenario, right? There are many, many anti-BCMA CAR T cell constructs that are in testing. There are two commercially available products that are you know, US FDA approved here in the US, Idacel and Siltacel. So you have to think back to when that wasn't the case. And so that study that you're thinking of, the 2018 publication, that study was, um, well, first of all, Jim Kopendorfer had to have the idea of BCMA as a target antigen, which I think back in the day, no one really thought about that. He first published the clinical results, you know, in 2013. Um, and then the trial started in 2014, which is really shortly after I had come to NCI as a fellow. So that was, you know, really novel. Um, it, the first patients that were treated, I think 
that was a project that was very sensitive to dose. So the first patients that were treated, really not a lot of activity at the kind of low, or even at this point, we would think sort of medium dose levels, dose levels that with other car products and car constructs, you would think, oh, this is going to be active, really not that much activity. And then suddenly at a fairly high, you know, cell dose, um, a lot of activity, a lot of activity, a lot of toxicity. And so I think when we were treating these patients, we were really worried about that toxicity. And I think in that first trial, um, it was still the very early days of CAR T cell therapy where we knew to give tocilizumab, we knew we could give steroids, but we didn't, is this going to hurt the patient? Is this going to hurt the T cells? We There was a lot that we weren't sure about, which I now, I think now with, I mean, retrospective, sure, but still very large um, retrospective series, we can really see that, oh, giving tocilizumab and giving, you know, even probably fairly hefty doses of corticosteroids is, you know, not really going to affect your patient's response. But, you know, even back then we didn't know that very well. Um, and even with really aggressive toxicity management, we still worried about toxicity for some of these patients. So I, I think one of the barriers was really how do we give this CAR T cell product safely? And I think what was learned fairly early on in the field is that burden of disease um, relates really strongly to toxicity and predisposition to toxicity. Um, and so, and this is, you know, this is not how a lot of the myeloma CAR T cell trials are run now, but we really limited it to patients with less bone marrow burden. So we could continue to study this CAR T cell product and learn more about it, but be able to treat patients safely. Um, and people ask me about this and sort of say, well, is this the right way to do this trial? And you kind of have to think about you know, it being the first anti-BCMA CAR T cell trial. Um, in that setting, yes, I think it was the right thing to do because, um, you know, we were able to study the CAR T cell product more and still um, treat patients safely. And I think, you know, now um, there's, you know, I think there's a lot of interest in the myeloma CAR world of can we, to the extent that patients are responsive, can we really bring them to CAR with as little disease as possible um, in terms of toxicity management and response? And so I think, you know, that that trial was us learning a few of those lessons really early in the beginning. Um, but, you know, patient, people, patients and people who participate in clinical trials are really amazing. And I really, you know, everyone says this, but I, I thank them and I thank their families because they really stepped up and did this thing that was high risk in terms of toxicity and that we really had no guarantee was going to work. We couldn't point to these large multi-center trials and say, oh, the response rate is X and the durability is X. You know, we just had no idea. Um, and it sounds a little scary, right? We're going to take your cells out. We're going to do something very mysterious with them in the lab, and then we're going to put them back in your body changed. Um, so, so yeah, there were definitely bumps in the road, but you know, I, Again, you know, coming back to it, you know, Jim Kokenov is an amazing mentor. This is an amazing place where we just have, you know, we're working with amazing clinicians on the inpatient service. So there was so much support to get that trial done um, that, yeah, I think it's a really important proof of concept trial. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely right. There are for sure bumps in the road when you're doing phase one trials and you're kind of figuring out how do we deal with toxicity or how do we deal with this problem as it comes along. Um, and even amending protocols as we need to. Um, that's that's very kind of typical of what we're doing here. And what amazed me the most in, in, in your study was this one patient um, with this um, malignant pl pleural effusion who had like, let's not complete response, but very good partial response, let's call it, which is, uh, you, and you show the, the pictures in, in the publication, it's quite amazing. And um, so uh, you alluded to what you didn't know in that time when you started the, um, the, the treatment. What would you say um, today? What, where are we now with CAR-T? What, what do you think? What do we know? Or what do we need to know um, urgently to, to make this maybe better, um, select patients better? And also this uh, yeah, enigma, early enigma, which has been maybe solved with kind of experience with nurse treatment or nurse, nurses education to treat early or intervene early um, or yeah, absolutely. observe yeah. the patients. What would you say are the unknowns in efficacy and safety in CAR-T at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start, I guess I'll start with 
Um, let me actually turn off my email. I'm so sorry. I meant to do this. All right. Um, so I'll start with where we are with commercial agents. So we have a, so many FDA approvals. Every it turns out that every sort of year I end up, you know, doing the sort of local trainee lectures for the institution, for the surgical fellows, and then for the medical oncology fellows. And I'm just constantly updating what the U.S. FDA has approved for CAR T-cell therapy. So we've got two, excuse me, FDA approved products that are um, anti-BCMA for multiple myeloma now. We have three products for large cell lymphoma and variants. We've got two products for follicular lymphoma, mantle cell, not CLL yet, but it's coming, um, I'm sure. Um, what am I missing here? ALL um, now, very recently with Bruxacel for adults. And then we've had to sell. That was the first one for pediatric patients. So we have a lot of options now. Um, I'll start with toxicity management because maybe that's the sort of easiest to take a bite out of. So I, I sort of talked about what things looked like, you know, on the ground clinically, maybe six years ago, maybe think back in 2016 to when we did, you know, our review in blood of CAR T cell toxicities. And at that point, there were enough clinical trials that a fellow could reasonably, you know, go through them and highlight and look for the different toxicities and then kind of tabulate them up. Um, so, you know, at that at that time, there was a lot we didn't know about toxicity management. I think that now that we have all these commercially available products, we have many, many astute clinicians who can manage CAR T cell toxicity. We know what to do with supportive care. We know that these patients sometimes require ICU care, and we know when to call the ICU early. Um, we know to give tocilizumab. And I think that, you know, we can argue all day about like when is the exact time to give tocilizumab, but we know from large spectrospective series that, um, you know, it's one or two, three doses is, you know, very safe to give in terms of response. We've got pretty good data in terms of durability and that, you know, um, certainly sort of small to moderate doses of corticosteroids, same thing. We should give those as we need to for toxicity and feel really comfortable with that. The data for sort of larger cumulative doses of cortis corticosteroids is a little bit contrary right now of some groups saying, you know, that I think there's a large MD Anderson series that, you know, I've talked about before that, you know, there's potentially a PFS OS signal. Um, that's of course very complicated because which patients get steroids, you know, Right. And then some series, there's a, a presentation at ASH um, where they really didn't see that, even with large numbers of patients getting, you know, uh, I think it was AxiCell, a fairly, you know, a product that's known to have toxicity. So that's a much better place. Um, and so I think that that we really know what we're doing a lot more of toxicity. Um, where do we need to go? I, I think that now there are some toxicities that we're um, maybe underrepresented, um, or maybe we just didn't, we hadn't seen the, the antigen targets enough that really caused them, but we're seeing kind of delayed HLH, um, not we're seeing, but it's being described in the literature. Um, Nirali Shah, I think has a really lovely description of this with her anti-CD22 car. Um, that's a little bit poorly understood, although seems manageable with Anna Kinra, for instance. Um, and um, we're seeing, you know, movement disorders with Siltacel, and it's on the, the label for Idacel. So I think with that as well, although I, I have to confess not knowing all the details of that, um, I think that's very poorly understood, that delayed sort of movement disorder, neurologic toxicity syndrome, although it seems to be manageable. Again, if you decrease burden of disease of the patient, if you intervene on CRS and ICANS fairly early, um, so I think those are, are kind of new things that we're figuring out. Um, I also think now, you know, once you get beyond tocilizumab and steroids, we have anti-cytokine therapies that people are using. It's off label, I should say, in the U.S. Um, more and more, but we don't know how to order them. We don't know in what scenario should we use anakinra? When should we use a JAK-STAT pathway agent, um, you know, TNF, even interferon gamma, can we, you know, use gamma fan off label? Um, there are sort of case reports and case series, but there's, there's nothing large enough to really say, aha, this is our flow diagram of what we should do to manage steroid refractory toxicities or what cytokine therapy we should use to maybe even avoid the larger cumulative long doses of corticosteroids. That's a little bit of a kind of unknown for the acute toxicities. 
And I think long-term toxicities, and we talked a little bit about this kind of earlier, um, are going to be are a very big deal right now. So we're seeing, um, and this is really across products, but we're seeing prolonged cytopenias in a subset of patients. Our data that we published fairly recently and data from other centers um, really shows that patients that have higher grade CRS, that have higher burden disease, especially higher burden marrow disease, and not in our series, but in some series, also more heavily pretreated patients, which totally makes sense, right? Because the marrow is affected at every step of therapy that those patients are the ones that seem to be at higher risk for these prolonged cytopenias. But we don't entirely understand the mechanism. We don't entirely understand how to treat it. We've used some off-label TPO agonists, but I don't know if that's the right thing to do. Other groups have, have done that in other case series. We sometimes use corticosteroids and patients seem to respond to that. Um, so that's a long-term toxicity that we don't totally have a handle of. And I think another toxicity is B-cell aplasia, which is, um, you know, previously this was a little bit kind of a check in the box. You would give the patient IVIG, you would sort of monitor their, their counts, their CD4 count, their peripheral B-cell count over time, but beyond IVIG or subcutaneous immunoglobulin replacement, there wasn't much you can do about it. And then COVID happened. Um, and our patients are very, very vulnerable. Our postcard patients to COVID, we know they don't respond as well to vaccines. We know they can have more severe illness. Um, and we know that they can actually carry the virus longer. Um, Veronique Neusenblatt, who's an infectious disease doctor here, actually recently published one of our patients who had um, really, who has really indefinite B cell aplasia after our Hue 19 car construct. Um, and she just really had a hard time clearing her virus and the virus actually mutated in vivo over time. Um, so I, that's a very serious thing for our patients and we really need to make sure that they're vaccinated. They could get Evushel, the monoclonal prophylactic, <clears throat> excuse me, therapy if possible. And then um, I really think there's a role for convalescent plasma in patients who are ill with COVID-19. So, so those long-term effects, I think, are a lot of the gain now. And while there are still things that we don't understand about acute toxicity, I, there are very there are larger publications are really showing much fewer deaths because these multicenter trials have algorithms in place so that we're intervening for toxicity early. Um, and small perspective series are just showing that we can give steroids and anakinra and tocilizumab earlier and earlier and earlier, potentially even prophylactically um, to prevent toxicity. So that's all kind of going in the right direction. But I think these atypical, somewhat delayed side effects and these really long-term toxicities are kind of where the game is right now. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of the sort of 30,000 foot view of the field, I think car construct is um, going to change a lot in the next five to 10 years, right? So all of our commercial products are fairly single, similar in that they have, you know, single chain FV, which is antibody derived, right? And the COSTIM domain, and which is either 41BB or CD28. And I think that's going to change a lot. Um, you know, we already have experience with a very different um, antigen recognition moiety, our most recent anti-BCMA construct, um, which the most recent results were presented ASH by like a Michael and any with our group. Um, you know, it has a heavy chain only domain. So that's a, you know, so there's not a linker. There's not, you know, a light chain. Um, there's, it's a very, it's very structurally different from what we've uh, sort of done before. And we're seeing more and more of that in the CAR T cell field. And um, I'm sure, you know, you've you sort of mentioned our Q19 product that was sort of meant to be, well, can we improve on the overall axi cell construct that the NCI has a lot of experience with? And so that has a fully human single chain FB. Um, and then has a CD28 co-stim domain, but also has a CD8 hinge and transmembrane region. And all of those, and a lentiviral vector, and all of those changes together, that was a very active CAR product, very similar to what we've seen in non-Hodgkin lymphoma with the axi cell um, construct, but was really not very toxic. Like neurotoxicity was very low. Only one patient out of 20 had severe neurotoxicity. So that was really proof of concept that with some tinkering to the car construct, you can get something really different. And so I think we're going to see all kinds of different variations. I mean, we're already seeing it, right? Ash and ASCO, all these abstracts, which this is, this is not the, the prior single chain FE that you're used to seeing. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think that's the way to go and is really exciting. Um, I think, you know, 
targeting multiple antigens, um, we're going to have fairly soon a new lymphoma trial that is a bisestronic construct targeting C19 and CD20, which um, Jim Kokendorfer and his colleagues have worked really hard on sort of optimizing in the lab. Um, I think with these bispecific studies, the idea, of course, is that you're going to prevent antigen escape. I think the data that we have out there now is a little bit variable in that sometimes we still see escape. And sometimes it seems like, oh, this really worked. And at least the very preliminary findings look like the response rate is really high, but then there's not, we don't have a durability signal yet. So I think the bispecific, I think that we just need to find the right constructs for the right diseases to have sort of multi-antigen targeted cars. Um, and that will be sort of the challenge in the next few years. But I think, you know, the dream is that, you know, multi-agent chemotherapy can put patients with large cell in remission, you don't just give them cytoxan. And the idea is that, you know, with CAR T cells, maybe we can have target multiple antigens, not have antigen escape, and then put patients in remission, um, maybe cure diseases that are currently incurable with CAR T cells um, by targeting, you know, multiple antigens. I think we'll see the cell culture process change a lot. I think we don't know what is the most optimum cell culture process, but so much work is being done on this. Of course, in Jim Kogendorfer's lab, a lot of work is being done on this. Um, you know, what is the right cytokine mix? Should we have a drug like a PI3, a PIK, excuse me, kinase inhibitor in there? Um, there's, you know, a lot that we don't really know. And then really fast cell processing. I think that's also really exciting. We're seeing these sort of point of care CAR T cells. Um, so there's, it's so exciting. It's really exciting. Um, there's so many whip, like different directions that the field is going right now. And I think five to 10 years we're going to have, um, I'm hoping knock on wood, you know, more commercially available CAR T cell products that are, you know, helping more patients is the ideal. Um, but asking you personally, um, from, from a hypothesis standpoint, because when, um, I, at least uh, in my early, early stage, look at the literature. So the response rates that stick to myeloma are quite the same across the board. I either you use single agent, a uh, single target or uh, by specifics. Um, by by specific, you mean like CD19, BCMA? Is exactly, that what you're saying? Yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. These tandem cars or bisestronic um what because you call uh, you, you told us about your uh, new approach what what do you think uh, from a structural standpoint is is the way to go make the car let's call it simpler or uh, yeah. because then there's always the discussion with the tandems are they too heavy um, um can they ha have the right affinity to the target uh, what, what do you think is 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 the way to go? Is it just trial and error at the moment and just an experiment? No, I think it's a really great point. Um, so yes, I think that tandem cars definitely have activity, right? Um, so that is one way to go. Another way to go is bisostronic, but there's a ribosomal skip domain, right? So then you have multiple cars on the same cell or even, um, and then, but one vector, right? And then you can even have multiple vectors or multiple car products. So there, there is, and this has been reviewed in other papers where they have like lovely diagrams showing each of these sort of options. And I don't think we know what the right option is. As I said, that the one we're developing now is by Um, So I like that. I think it looks good. Um, I think that, you know, there's very respectable data with the tandem cars for sure. Um, we do, we do sometimes see, um, antigen escape, especially, you know, these CD22 low populations, for instance. Um, so, but I don't, I don't know, um, I don't know what's going to fix that. Um, I, you know, Noelle Frey presented her trial where it really was multiple car infusions, right? They had their human C19 product and then C22. And so, um, results were really very preliminary, but really exciting in her ALL patients, including patients that had had CAR T cells in the past. I actually had a patient that I really wanted to participate in that trial, but it didn't, he, you know, it didn't work out. Um, but because of the patient, not because of Dr. Frey. Um, and it's very impressive, but, you know, she also had sort of two peaks of toxicity. So if you put in two car products, that's, you know, potentially a negative. Although again, we're now a lot better at managing 
acute toxicity. Um, so I don't know what the right answer is. I'm really excited about what we're doing and what we're seeing kind of in the future, but I think we're going to find out that, um, that we can do a pretty good job of preventing a lot of the antigen escape. I think that's going to end up being sort of low hanging fruit, although it doesn't seem that way right now. Um, but yeah, I don't have the exact answer for you right now, unfortunately. Um, I, I definitely, yeah, tandem cars are, can be very active. So I definitely don't want <laughs> to say bad things about tandem cars. <laughs> and, and what do you think is um, the main driver for relapse? Uh, because that's also quite a complex field either it's really just the escape antigen escape or is it uh, driven from the microenvironment or... yeah we see a lot of antigen i mean not obviously not 100 percent, but we do see antigen escape for sure and i i think that that was early on really recognized in leukemia um, but now we know it happens in lymphoma and that because the marrow is so accessible, right? So we could see that right away. Um, but in lymphoma, it happens. We know from biopsies for our Q19 trial, we knew really early on back in 2016, that some of our patients that the mechanism of escape was C19 negative disease in the lymph nodes. Um, we know that myeloma too. We even in our first trial, there's one patient I'm thinking of specifically that kind of he had kind of a mix, but he, he had some BCMA dim for sure, if not totally negative cells at his relapse. So I, I think that's a huge mechanism. I think you're right, the microenvironment, and you know, many, many people say this, but I think this is especially the barrier in solid tumors. I think to some extent this is the barrier in Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, that just the micro environment is very, very immune suppressive. So you can't even from the get go get a response. Now in solid tumors, um, I think something that's very, that's I guess new for me, but pretty new in the field is that we are starting to see some mechanisms of getting around that. Um, I'm thinking about the report of the PSMA um, targeted car for prostate cancer that was in Nature Medicine fairly recently and that James Gully and um, Jay Redman here from NCI wrote this really nice editorial for. So that has, you know, basically it has a mechanism of inhibiting TGF beta, which itself is kind of a inhibitory cytokine. Um, and so they saw toxicity and they saw responses and they saw expansion of the CAR T cell product, which even just a few years ago, you weren't really seeing in solid tumor trials. And now suddenly we're seeing it with, you know, multiple CAR constructs and we're seeing more of these kind of armored cars, you know, IL-15 armored cars and these sorts of things. And I, I think that will be eventually what gets us through to treat, you know, solid tumors. But yeah, I do think the the microenvironment is probably a part of it, especially in solid tumors. And then I think in hemolignancies, it's in part, it's just not, it's maybe that the construct needs to be optimized. It's, and we see this across hemolignancies too, it's maybe that the initial starting cell product does not have enough naive cells. And so again, we're working on here ways to really optimize the cell culture process and many, many other investigators are working on ways to do that. Um, so I, I think that that's kind of a large part of it too, that we have to have the right construct. You have to have the right cell processing for the right disease. And that maybe the microenvironment is a little less important in some of these, the hematologic malignancies, but I think is really a very important game in terms of the solid tumors. Um, but we're, I think, gradually seeing solutions to all of these. I'm kind of a, a constant optimist, as you can see. So I, I think that, you know, there will be solutions to these problems. Um, many more, way more brilliant people than me figuring it out, but I, I, I do think it's going to happen. I'm happy that we agree on being optimistic. I'm yeah. also quite optimistic. And what I like um, about the field is just the constant creativity and the production and the um, rethinking process on okay what can we do what how can we overcome this uh, limitation and how can we design it's kind of an engineering process uh which i really like because it um yeah rescues you from this uh, what medicine sometimes can have this like uh, usual treatment sequence that you try every day and it works fine but only because you don't have anything better 
and this is produces some kind of like frustration or as a for instance as a young colleague it's it yeah is a great obstacle for for open questioning what could, what could we do what could we address um in that regard i would like to ask you what um for young colleagues because you, you talked about so many things um in cellular therapies and and car t what do you have do you have any advice uh for for them um from your experiences maybe from your what you wish now what would have been done for you or what you could have done better or what could have been better in general from from the whole system um what or would you have done something differently in the past? Um, do, do you have any advice for, for young colleagues who are interested in CAR-T? Yeah, I mean, I think anyone who's interested in oncology, um, what I see sometimes with folks coming through the system or even kind of interviewing for a fellowship is that they have this really specific idea of, oh, I'm interested in this disease and this type of therapy. I think that can kind of put you down the wrong path sometimes. Um, and it's much better to be really open-minded and have the focus be to really absorb and learn as much as you can um, and really find the people who are doing cool things and just to hang out with them with no expectations, right? So people who are amazing clinicians, people that are amazing researchers, um, even if it's something that you don't initially feel interested in, just try to spend time with them, ask them questions, try to take care of their patients, because if you do something <laughs> clinical for someone who has clinical responsibilities, then you may free them up to give them more time to teach you. Um, and not to put too much pressure on yourself to kind of make decisions. Um, I think that, I think that's kind of what I ended up doing, maybe not intentionally, but that worked out really well for me. Um, it's just finding those people that I really admired and tried to spend time with them and learn from them. And you find that, you know, again, there's no guidebook to medical training. So you find that sometimes the opportunity that you really kind of need as a trainee is someone turns to you in an elevator and says, oh, I have this data. Do you want to write it up? Um, you know, and it's, that's it. Like there's no multiple choice test. There's, there's no like formal selection process that person had whatever they were working on, on their mind. And they saw you in the elevator next to them and was like, Oh, hardworking person. Why don't you work on this with me? Um, you know, that's kind of how it goes a lot of the time. And then you're just lucky if you're in the right place at the right time, essentially. <laughs> I'll also say that something that I, in terms of doing things, wanting to do things differently, something I may have done in the beginning of fellowship was I just really noticed that a lot of the investigators here, and I'll say that folks, again, working on these fairly high risk phase one clinical trials um, were, they really watched the medical trainees very carefully and made sure that everything was done perfectly for their patients. And my interpretation of that after having finished you know, residency where the, the design is at the, at the end of residency, you have a fair amount of autonomy with internal medicine patients, you know, and that you yourself were even supervising trainees that are a little bit earlier in the process than you are. So, um, you know, I was really kind of surprised when, oh, I think I'm being micromanaged by these brilliant people that I admire. They really must not trust me. Um, but then, you know, I came to sort of find that, no, they're just really worried about their patients because their patients are getting, you know, they have life-threatening cancer and are getting these really experimental um, immunotherapies often. And they, they maybe, they don't know what the right thing to do is either. And they just want to make sure that we're all on the same page doing something for these patients. Um, and so I think I really didn't realize that until, you know, several months in, oh, it has nothing to do with me. Um, and so I think, you know, I think that obviously that at the, here at the NCI, at the clinical center, that's a very particular sort of scenario, but I think it does translate to other training situations that, some, that you know, if someone seems to be micromanaging you or, um, you know, even if someone, I, you know, Mark Ruszewski, I think, like sat me down in a clinic and said, oh, you said this thing in your presentation that turned out to be wrong. Let me like explain to you in gory detail why it was wrong. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this guy must think I'm incompetent. But really, he, you know, saw potential and wanted to take the time to teach me. Um, and so when we're, I'm talking about that, that seems kind of obvious, but I think it's really not obvious when you're the trainee in the situation. So always try to think from the perspective of the other person, you know, is this 
is this really about me needing to do something better? And if it is great, work on doing that better. We all have to work on doing things better. But if it's really about the particular patient scenario or about the mood of the person that is talking with you, you know, really try to take that consideration because I've been really surprised people that I, I thought, um, you know, that I, that I worked with clinically and maybe I thought they didn't remember me or they even didn't like me. Those are the people that you can call on later to get career advice from, and they're just so thrilled to talk with you. And now that I'm you know, in the transition from early to mid-career, I'm more and more sort of getting those calls. And I, I just love to talk to people that I've met you know, in the situation of them being medical trainees and try to give them you know, who knows how much my advice is worth, but you know, any advice for um, their careers. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's what I would do differently. Try to think, uh, think in the attendings sort of, sort of shoes. And um, um, I'll also say something that I've found is that folks, you have, you know, your mentors and the people that are helping you with your particular research projects, both as a trainee and then, you know, after training this sort of like an early, early career person. Um, but then there are always other people who are kind of your mentors and advocates and, you know, make sure to sort of keep track of them and let them know about your progress and how you're doing. Um, and I think that I've, I've been perpetually surprised how, how open and lovely very senior people are to talking with me and kind of helping me and giving me career advice. Um, so I guess, I guess those in no particular order, those are my thoughts on training. <laughs> But it, it, it makes uh, the whole story quite lovely. And it makes me actually hungry for, <laughs> for NIH, to be honest. When you, when you um, tell all the stories, it's, um, it's a really, yeah, uh, education and the path of a trainee is sometimes a bit ambiguous and self-insecurity and everything, but mutilation and, but you get it, you get over it, I think. And as long as you like stay optimistic, as you said. Um, and I think uh, another thing that Europeans can learn from you, and I always noted this from the first time I, I went to the US, is this really natural optimism and, and belief in yourself. And um, Europeans, especially Germans, <laughs> tend to uh, play this whole thingy well I don't know I'm not really confident but in their heart they try to be um, but that hinders them to really just go out and do stuff right and, and that's, oh, that's really uh, funny yeah I mean we all have a lot of insecurity right so it shouldn't get it like everyone I promise everyone has at least some level of insecurity and so yeah don't definitely do it don't definitely do as much as you can try to take the really big bite out of the apple you know if you think that you're taking too big of a bite i've been there before um yeah i think i think you're exactly right that you just just mm -hmm. acknowledge your insecurity and then try to keep going and know that you're everyone's always learning right like again this is a sort of very silly metaphor but it's you know it, class like undergraduate school and med school is so organized and then there's a test and there's an end and this is the amount of material you're supposed to know but then you get out there and there's no end to the material and there's so much that's unknown um to anyone even the really brilliant people don't know it and so that's um i think if you're used to a lot of the structure that the educational process brings positive and negative then that's a little bit disconcerting that you know oh now no one knows the answer to this question you know i don't know it but no one else knows it um you know, or like, I don't know it, but I need to learn. I need to read X, Y, or Z or see this type of patient. And I think that's really exciting, positive on one hand and challenging on the other. We went full circle from the start to the end now. Um, <laughs> it was a beautiful uh, standpoint you made at the beginning and now finished with that. Uh, I think we can end with that. I, I cannot stress enough and cannot really say how grateful I am and happy I am that it that you responded to our request and I'm really really happy to to have had this opportunity to talk to you I'm, I'm I, I said and I say say it again I'm a big fan oh thank you no this was this was really <laughs> fun I appreciate it and then you know we're at the point in COVID where maybe we'll run into each other at meetings in person for real hopefully, you know? hopefully. yeah <laughs> hopefully so all right well take care thank you so much yeah have a good day you too and Hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. -bye.